<laughs> well, we don't have a. Speaking, speaking, hello. They can zoom here and zoom here. Yep, we can hear. Oh, great. It works perfect. Podia are all kind of unified. So. I just have to be. Oh. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Well, in this case, I guess we can go with you. And maybe somebody did finally put it on the table. We did it. <laughs> people in the room here. Yes. Yeah. Go for it. Okay, you're gonna fix the lights? I'll figure it out or something. Okay. There's all these buttons. All right, well, today we, we're uh, very happy to have a, a former Rice student who graduated in 2016 uh, and had done some research in the group uh, with Mark Cochran um, come back and tell us about her uh, PhD work at MIT. And um, she's now uh, just joined uh, Fermilab as a postdoc and is continuing to work on neutrinos. But we'll hear her uh, take on the sterile neutrino uh, data or lack thereof. And uh, the, the information, uh, the latest and greatest from Microboon, which you may have heard about in the fall, which was addressing those questions. So yep. Very excited to have Lauren here today. Very excited to be here. OK, without further ado, I will get started. Sorry, I was running a little bit late. Um, Okay, I'm going to start where hopefully we can all agree with the standard model of particle physics. So um, this is a handy dandy chart of the standard model. 
it describes all the known um, particles and their interactions. Everybody probably has their favorite particles in this chart. Mine are the neutrinos. Um, so, a few fun facts about neutrinos. Uh, as far as we can tell, they're the most abundant mass of particle in the universe. Trillions of them pass through every second, mostly from the sun. Um, they are electrically neutral and interact extremely weakly, which makes them both uh, very challenging to measure, very interesting. Um, and they're so light, we actually haven't been able to measure their mass yet. So we have upper bounds, but no actual measurement. Um, that's a whole area of research that I am not going to talk about today. So uh, when neutrinos do interact, they interact via the weak interaction mediated by the W or the Z boson. Um, can you see my cursor? Yeah, it's on the right. Yeah, uh, we can. Okay, it's slow though, so maybe we won't do that. Okay, so um, we have charge current interactions. Those interactions are mediated by the W, and they couple the neutrino to their charged lepton counterpart. So, for example, if you have a muon neutrino come in, they'll have a muon go out, and you'll have a corresponding change in the charge of whatever's on the other side of the diagram. Um, on the other hand, with the Z interaction, we call that a neutral current interaction, and in that case, neutrino goes in, neutrino comes out, we have no idea what the flavor was, um, and all we see is some energy and momentum imparted to whatever's on the other side of the diagram. So I've drawn these with quarks, which is all nice and good in terms of drawing Feynman diagrams. Um, but at microboon's energies, at the energy scale that I'm talking about today, those quarks are bound in nucleons, and those nucleons are bound within a nucleus. Um, this makes our lives interesting, and I will come back to that. Um, the other thing to maybe know about neutrinos is neutrino oscillation. So for many years, many decades really, experiments that are sensitive to a specific flavor of neutrino observe fewer of those neutrino interactions than they expected. And for a while, nobody really understood why. Um, and then evidence kind of clicked into place, um, including but not limited to the fact that the fraction of neutrinos that seemed to have disappeared depended on the distance those neutrinos had traveled from their source. So, um, end result, this phenomenon is best explained by the idea that the neutrino flavor eigenstates, the ones that we put in our little standard model chart, nui, nu, mu, and tau, are not equivalent to the mass eigenstates, but actually some linear superposition of them. So we get this unitary mixing matrix. Um, this is the equivalent of the CKM matrix in the quark sector, if that's something that you're familiar with. Um, and we get this mixing between the states. So um, in two neutrino mixing, you can think of this as a simple rotation in a 2D plane. In the 3D place case, it's more complicated, but it's the same idea. Um, so I'll start out talking about the math in terms of what happens when we have just two neutrinos, because it gets most of the point across, but it's all a lot simpler. So um, usually we talk about the oscillation probability the probability that if you started in one state, you observe in the other state. So for the two neutrino case, we have two flavors, two mass states, and one mixing matrix that can be parameterized in terms of the single angle theta. And then our oscillation probability comes out to this expression over here, um, where we have sine squared two theta, that mixing angle, and then a second term that sine squared of this delta m squared, which is right here, um, times L over E with some constants. So uh, basically what happens is the sine squared two theta term determines the amplitude of that oscillation wave, and then this uh, sine squared delta M squared L over E term, um, that L over E is sort of a function of the oscillation experiment as you've set it up, the neutrino baseline and the energy, um, and then that delta M squared controls the wavelength of those oscillations. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so in the minimal extension of the standard model that includes a neutrino mass, we have three mass states, which means we have two mass splittings. So you get two characteristic wavelengths. We have those super short um, wavelength oscillations, these things that look like wiggles. Um, that's what we call the atmospheric neutrino mass splitting. 
And then we have these longer wavelength oscillations. Um, that's a solar neutrino mass splitting. That detail isn't super important, mm. but these parameters have been measured pretty well. Question? Yeah. Okay. So you see these little wiggles superimposed on these longer wavelength wiggles. So this is all well and good, except that several experiments have probed um, even shorter baselines than this. So this is the same plot as the previous slide, just now on a log scale to kind of hone in on this low L over E region. So various experiments have made measures, measurements kind of, you know, here and even off the lower end of this plot. And they see stuff that is not what they expected to see, not what the sort of minimal attention to the standard model picks. So um, various things could be going on, but one of the ideas is that there's a new neutrino with a new mass splitting that's driving even shorter wavelength oscillations about these curves. So um, that's a sterile neutrino. I'm now gonna talk about uh, a couple of experiments that have explored some of this space, starting with Alice and D. So Alice and D studied primarily anti-muon neutrino or nu mu bar to um, nu e bar oscillations using anti-muon neutrinos from um, a sample of mu plus that decay at rest. So um, in this case, the detection mechanism uses inverse beta decay, which is a pretty well-known process. You have nu e bar that come into their detector, interact with a proton in liquid simulator, basically hydrocarbon, that produces a positron and a neutron. So you see a prime signature from the positron, and then that neutron will wander about the detector and capture to produce deuterium, which comes with a 2.2 MeV gamma. And you can see that gamma. So um, that coincidence between the positron and the delayed neutron capture uh, reduces their backgrounds. So they select a sample of events that looks like this plot over here. So their uh, expected beam related backgrounds are this red and green here. And then you can see their data sitting reasonably far above that. Um, and so that's the LSND excess or the LSND anomaly. Uh, and the significance of that is 3.8 sigma. So the next experiment I'll talk about is mini boon here. This is the uh, sort of predecessor to Microboon, if you will. So Miniboon itself was a follow-up to LSND. Um, so it was trying to probe this oscillation hypothesis for the LSND XS by using the same L over E, so exploring the same oscillation parameters, but otherwise a pretty different experimental setup. So um, much higher energies, the beam peaks around 5, 6, 800, 800 MeV, um, and then a correspondingly longer L, to end up at a similar L over E, about one meter per MeV. Um, so mini boon studied primarily nu mu to nu E appearance oscillations using the booster neutrino beam line of Fermilab um, and mineral oil shrink up detector, which looks like this, basically a big glow of mineral oil with a bunch of PMAs. Um, so this is mini boon's observation. Um, I'll well for a minute on this plot because it's going to come up a few more times um, and is important to motivating the micro results that I'm going to talk about. Um, so this is Mini Boon's uh, selection of electron neutrino candidates in their data. These stacked colors here are their expected backgrounds and the data are these black points. You can see it rising well above the predicted backgrounds at low energy. So um, I'll point out a few more things. One is that these three <laughs> green colors here represent the expected intrinsic mu e contamination in the booster neutrino beam. It's a mostly bond neutrino beam, but there are some electron neutrinos. That's the screen color. Um, then the other thing I'll say is basically all these other colors, red, mustard yellow, brown, and gray, are various backgrounds that they have that are not in these. Um, and most of these involve photons. So, because of the type of detector that mini boon is, it can't really tell electrons from photons at all. Um, so these events are true photons that sneak in one way or another into their new candidate selection. Cool. Yeah. So what's dirt? Dirt is radioactivity and... No, dirt is um, neutrino interactions that happened in the dirt outside of the detector. 
And part of that interaction snuck into the detector and made something that looks like a neutrino. Um, so it's in time with the beam, or close to in time with the beam, but it's not uh, a neutrino interaction in the detector, it's a neutrino interaction. Um, okay, and yeah, to add to that, maybe those final results give a combined, uh, between anti-neutrino and anti-neutrino mode, a combined excess of about 4.8 sigma. So pretty significant and in a similar region of phase space to LSMD. So together, these two are pretty suggestive. Um, but maybe not conclusive. So enter um, the SBN program from me lab, including my Gherkin. So um, Mini Moon is up there, pointed to by the red box. It looks like a little mound of dirt in this aerial picture because that's what it looks like. Um, but there's the sphere of mineral oil underneath that. Then we've got Micro Moon, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. You can see pretty much right next to each other in the booster neutrino mine, which is running kind of bottom to top on the slide. Um, and so Microboon was proposed as a follow-up to Miniboon. Um, and as a first step in understanding the Miniboon anomaly, is aiming to check the existence of the excess and to try and determine whether it's from real electrons, from electron neutrino interactions, or whether it's actually photons from something else. Um, and then Microboon itself is actually the first phase of this three detector SVN program, um, so consisting of uh, SPND down here, relatively close to the beam, microboon, uh, and then Icarus is a far detector, or a second far detector, I guess. Um, so quick shout out, I'm now working on SPND, um, that's under construction, we're working on building it, pretty cool. Um, Icarus is running, and uh, yeah, microboon is what I'm talking about today. So. Um, together, this three detector program, because we can have measure the same beam at three different baselines, um, gives a really powerful handle on any potential oscillation signature. Um, so it'll really cover that many moon space. Um, and all three of these detectors are using a different and I would argue much better um, detector technology called a liquid argon TPC. RTPC for short, I'm going to say that about a hundred times, sorry. Um, so, how does LRTPC work? It's basically a big cryostat filled with liquid argon, um, and there's a region of it within that cryostat that is under an electric field. So what happens is a neutrino comes in, uh, lots of neutrinos come in, actually once in a while, one of them will interact with an argon nucleus in the detector, that creates what we call the interaction vertex. And some charged particles come out. So what we see is those charged particles. Um, and those charged particles do two things as they kind of travel through the liquid argon and deposit their energy. So one is that they'll create scintillation light. Argon is wonderfully transparent with some scintillation light. So we have an array of 32 PMTs that pick that up. Um, and that signal in the big scheme of large PCs is prompt. It gives us exactly when the neutrino interaction happened. Um, then those charged particles, as they travel through the argon, will also ionize some of it. And those ionization electrons get picked up by this electric field and drifted over to three sets of sense wires. Um, the sense wires are in three planes. They're strung in different orientations. One is vertical. The other two go at plus minus 60 degrees. And those give us three different views of the interaction that happened. So the vertical wires basically give us this view as if you were looking at the detector from top down. Um, so that image looks like this. Each of these columns in the image represents a wire in the detector. Each row represents a time at which some of the ionization charge arrived at the wire plane. And the colors of these pixels represent the amount of charge. So this kind of blue background color is no charge. Um, the sort of light light blue is a little bit of charge and then the brighter colors are more charge. So um, this is a simulated event so I can tell you exactly what happened in it. In this case this is a proton. Um, you can see it as a short straight and uh, although it's hard to tell because I haven't put a scale on this, relatively highly ionizing track and you can actually see hopefully it's a little brighter at the end than it is at the beginning and that's the Bragg 
of the proton as it comes to a stop, depositing more energy towards that end. Um, and on the other side, this is a shower from an electron um, that makes sort of this electromagnetic shower, which is a little bit more diffuse than that. Um, and then we get from the other two planes, we get two other views of the same interaction, and that helps us piece together what actually happened in 3D. Okay, so as I said before, mini moon can't really tell the difference between electrons and photons. One of the reasons that large EPCs are better, especially for addressing the mini moon anomaly, is that we can. So um, there are two main handles that we have for this. One is the amount of ionization that gets deposited at the vertex um, or in the trunk of the shower near the vertex. So um, for an electron, you're just seeing the ionization from the electron directly. That deposits about two mm per centimeter. That's this green peak on this plot. Um, and then for a photon, what you see at the trunk of the shower is not the photon. The photon is neutral. It doesn't ionize itself. But that photon at the relevant energy scales will pair produce. So you get an E plus and minus pair that are on top of each other. And because of that, you have about twice the ionization, about four mm. So that's this red peak over here. Um, so that's nice. The other handle that we have is whether the shower itself is attached to the neutrino vertex. So in the electron case, if the electron comes out of the interaction, it starts ionizing immediately, and you'll get no gap between the interaction vertex and the start of the shower. On the other hand, for a photon, there's a conversion distance, typically a um, few centimeters, tens of centimeters, something like that. In that case, microbeam can see the gap between the vertex and the start of the shower. <laughs> so you'll get this visible gap, and that's another handle for electron photon separation in a large piece. So what is the, the red uh, for the gammas, the histogram? Um, this is the, see, yeah, this is the um, amount of energy deposited uh, for the red light. And the histogram. Yeah. Well, what is the, the, I cannot see the labels on the colors. Uh, that's photons. The True photons. photons. Could be neutral current, by or anything? Um, these are just the particles that created the shower, or the reconstructed shower, and not uh, anything about the interaction, actually. Um, that paper has more information. I'm happy to send it to you, except I don't know your name. But follow up with me after the talk. Um, so uh, OK, microbeam, as an experiment, we took neutrino beam data from October 2015 um, until March 2020. In that time, we operated very smoothly, greater than 95% detector uptime. Um, we collected all this data. Um, and actually, the current analyses, including what I'm going to be talking about today, only use about the first half of it, the first three years of data taking. Um, so one of the things to look forward to in this big scheme of the future of microbeam is analyses that use the full data set, so the other half of the data. So okay. Quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Are you drifting the full 10 meters, or? Um, so we're drifting. Or is it pieces? The drift direction is this direction, so we're drifting okay. 2.5 meters. OK. Yeah. Um, Cool. Are you going to keep taking data? Or is the um, that is not currently in the plan. Oh, so this is at the moment the set of. The detector is sleeping um, without the intention of turning it on again, but without irrevocably turning it off either. Um, yeah, this is this is what Microbeam requested when we proposed the experiment. This is what we've got. There's no current plans to take more data. Um, kind of wish there was, but I'm not in charge. Um, okay, so this is a little bit of a roadmap um, for how we set about addressing this mini moon anomaly. Um, so I'm not going to talk about most of this in depth, but just to provide a little bit of a framework. So we did a lot of work to understand the detector, um, understanding and modeling detector effects, and also calibrating the detector response. We also did substantial work and are continuing to do substantial work in understanding um, neutrino argon interactions at the DEV scale. This is a place where nuclear physics really matters and it's not well understood. Um, so this is something that we're measuring, testing against different models, tuning our models, etc. Um, those could each be seminars unto themselves easily. Sorry, I don't have time to do it all today. Um, we also went through this process of constraining our systematic uncertainties using various sideband measurements. Um, to constrain our expectations <coughs> for our backgrounds. 
mostly the theme intrinsic backgrounds. Um, that is something I will circle back to. It's also a huge part of my PhD thesis, so congratulations, you get to hear about it. Um, and all of these pieces come together to our search for the excess. Um, so in this case, we define you know, a, a hypothesis for what was driving the excess, define a channel to search for that hypothesis, then you, know, you develop your selection, and you go look for it. Um, and I'll just emphasize for a second here that we did this using a blinded analysis approach. So we developed our analysis, froze it, and then unblinded um, as a method to minimize bias in our results. So um, in Microbeam's first searches to pursue uh, this mini moon anomaly, um, the low energy excess, the LEE, we like to call it for short, um, we picked two hypotheses to test. So one is that that excess in the mini moon plot is coming from true charge current and Nui interactions, um, basically an enhancement of the green contributions to the prediction in mini moon. The other hypothesis we tested is um, single photons coming from a process called NC delta radiative decay, which is the mustard yellow color in the mini moon plot. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more later, so I'll just say that for now. Um, but each of these two hypotheses that we tested, we investigated multiple signal topologies in different ways. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so we also have three independent reconstruction paradigms. Uh, we have the wire cell reconstruction, the deep learning based reconstruction, and the Pandora multi algorithm toolkit. Um, for the electron like searches, we did one using each of these three. And for the photon like search, um, there's just one of them, and that was. Pandora based, although uh, more photon like searches are underway, um, including using wire cell. Um, I'll start off talking about the low energy UE searches. Um, so there are three analyses, each use a different reconstruction approach and a different signal topology. Um, so there's the uh, CCQE 1E1P search. So this is searching for events that look like this 1E or 1 electron and one P, one proton. So it's a pretty simple topology. Um, and this topology primarily comes from what we call charge current quasi-elastic interactions, um, where the neutrino is effectively <coughs> scattering off a single neutron in the nucleus in a elastic-ish way, up to the fact that that neutron is bound. Um, so it also has this two-body scattering kinematic topology that is very powerful. Um, in terms of helping to reject backgrounds that might look like this in a picture, but not have the right kinematics. Um, there are two other searches. So the uh, 1E NP plus 1E zero P selection. This is looking for events with either one or more protons or zero protons and one electron, but no pions. Um, this is a particularly interesting channel in terms of the minimum room result because this essentially reflects the channels that mini boon would be sensitive to. Um, they have some handles for rejecting pions, but no idea what's going on with protons just because of the type of detector. Um, and then finally, there's a fully inclusive search looking for one electron plus anything or nothing um, as a third channel. And as I said, each of these use a different reconstruction. So the CCQE 1E1P is deep learning based. The pionless search is Pandora based. The inclusive search is wire cell based. So, um, these three largely independent analyses provide pretty powerful cross-checks of each other. Each of these three is testing the same signal hypothesis. Um, this is focusing, all three analyses use the same sort of simplified um, phenomenological model, if you will. So what we did is we took the mini boon excess compared to the mini boon prediction, and we unfolded that from mini boon reconstructed space into true neutrino energy space. And we get weights that look like this. Um, and you can kind of see how this lines up comparing the reconstructed plot. But it's a very strong enhancement at low energies, like factors of five or six, um, and then rapidly falling off into the medium energies and below 800, or sorry, above 800, basically nothing, because the mini boon data above that point basically matches up with our prediction. So it's the strong enhancement of low energy and medium interactions. Um, and we just took these weights and applied them to microboon prediction. And then we can look at that in the microboon reconstructed space. 
So uh, this was our model. And I kind of already said this, and I'm running a little behind, so I'm going to gloss over that. Um, but I'm going to focus on the CCQE1E1P analysis, because this was my thesis analysis. So here we are. Um, this is sort of a quick overview of uh, the steps in the analysis. Um, first up, there's some sort of signal processing and cosmic rejection steps. For a surface detector, we get a lot of cosmics. It's just our lot in life. Um, then comes our sort of reconstruction steps. So we have um, a semantic segmentation algorithm that's deep learning based, some 3D reconstruction um, to find our vertex and our tracks and our showers, um, and then an additional reconstruction step looking at particle identification using um, a second deep learning algorithm. I'll talk about those two in a little bit more detail because deep learning is fun. Um, and then we go and select our events um, for the 1E1P, which is our signal, and then a comparable sample of 1E1P, which we use to constrain the systematics like I was talking about earlier. Um, and then the constrained 1E1P prediction and observation is the input for our statistical analysis, um, which I'll also talk about in a little, little bit of detail. So, um, First up, I want to talk about those 2D learning algorithms. So uh, the first one is um, the semantic segmentation, which we primarily use to label pixels in the event as either track-like or shower-like. Um, so here I have an event image. This is basically what comes out of the detector after our signal processing. Um, and then over here, I have the same uh, image. This is actually from our data as labeled by the network. Um, so you can see the track-like particles are either white or green, um, and the shower is this yellow color. Um, so this gives us basically pixel by pixel a handle on what we think we're seeing in the event. Um, there's a cool paper on this. I don't have time for all the details, but this performs really, really well. Um, so our pixel labeling accuracy for this track versus shower classification does uh, labels pixels accurately to greater than 99% for both tracks and showers. Um, and it also employs a sparse network architecture, which uh, feel free to ask me more. But um, basically, it operates on these images while ignoring all of the empty pixels. Um, this actually improved the performance of the network compared to a previous network that was um, had a dense architecture. But it also significantly reduced our computational needs to actually do the inference on these images. And that was a huge boon in terms of being able to push our data through and also being able to look at entire images together instead of crops. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a slide with any details on that? Um, the sparse network architecture. Just how you're doing that labeling? Um, no, but I would be happy to talk about that. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a backup slide. So how how yeah. often are you getting events like this? Events like this? Well, I mean, sorry, I guess what's the rate at which you're yeah. Um, that is a little more I should know. We get about 200,000 events in a year of data. Okay. Um, so, and, um, but sorry, but most of those are cosmics. Most of those don't have neutrinos. About one in 600 has a neutrino. Right. I'll let you do the math from there. Um, yeah, we get okay. not a lot of neutrinos. Um, and as will become apparent, this is a statistic limited measurement. Um, all the more reason to look forward to us having more data. Um, so uh, I also wanted to talk about the multiple particle identification. Um, so the goal here is instead of looking pixel by pixel at the image, we look at the whole image together and we ask the network to tell us what is the probability that there is a particle of each of these five types in this image. Um, so here I've got an example of a 1E1P event, like our signal. And you can see, it says, ah, yes, I think there's an electron. The score is close to one. Ah, uh, yes, I think there's a proton. The score is also close to one. And then um, photons, neons, and ions, not so much. So this is exactly what we want to see. Um, and this is really, really useful in helping to reject um, backgrounds that might have muons or photons in them that sneak into our 1E1P selection otherwise. Um, and I don't have a lot of details on this. But we validated this um, on data using uh, samples of new events where we uh, have other handles to figure out what's going on um, and more statistics, obviously. So, uh, yeah, that's. A uh, question. Yeah, uh, go ahead. So how, based on which kind of physics property you do the PID? 
Um, so it's whatever the network sees in the image, which is basically the ionization patterns that are showing up. Um, and I should say that this network, as well as the other one, are very carefully trained um, on what we call, uh, informally anyway, particle bombs. So we have random sets of particles with sort of uniformly distributed momenta coming out of the vertex. So it's not learning or biasing itself on the neutrino interaction kinematics. Um, that was something we thought long and hard about when we were deciding how to train these dyes. Um, did that answer your question? Also happy to talk more after. Um, okay, so <laughs> skipping over some details, um, we end up with our event selection. So on the left here, I have our selection of one E1P candidates. Um, I'll just point out quickly that there's a total of 25 events in that plot across 10 bins. Like I said, very stats limited, um, but that's what we got. Um, and then on the new mu side, this is the corresponding sample of one U1P events selected using parallel analysis tools, but just looking for a muon on a proton instead of an electron on a proton. Um, and this has almost 5,000 events in it. So much more statistics and a great way to validate our reconstruction tools um, and help inform some of the uh, systematics um, for the one uh, And I'll just pop over quickly here. So basically this magenta plus this green is our expected backgrounds in the absence of any LVE signal and then this dashed blue histogram that you can see sitting on top is what happens when we add the LDE signal model in that I described earlier. Now you're just coming from cross-section times of loss, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, plus reconstruction effects, efficiency, and that kind of stuff. But you won't follow enough of that, right? You don't follow it, so that. Yes. Right for that yeah, the, the, oh, yeah. The feeding the weights through at the truth level corrects for all of that. But well, at the end of the day, it's just loss sometimes. Basically. How far does a proton need to go for you to be able to resolve it, or what energy? Or um, what? The threshold on our protons can probably be pushed lower in principle, but right now it's 40, 50, 60 MeV of kinetic energy, um, which is a few centimeters in liquid or not. Um, okay, you guys can hear about uncertainties because this is what I contributed to the analysis. Um, so these two plots here are showing for the one E1P on the left and the one E1P on the right, um, the sources of systematic uncertainty. So uh, I've got flux in red, cross-section in orange, um, pattern reinfraction, which I won't really explain, but that's small, in green, um, detector-related, detector modeling, uncertainties in blue, um, and then are actually our MC stat errors in gray, which are not super small, and then the quadrature sum in black. So um, you can see over most of our energy range, uh, Cross-section systematics are dominant, particularly for the um, one mu and p, and then the detector uh, start to matter more at high energies. And that's mostly bigger events take up more space in the detector. More things can go wrong. Detector systematics get bigger. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. About the detector systematics, I would imagine for the one for the electrons. Yeah. Showers are more. Uh, I mean, so, more obvious. Um, high energies. So what is the what is driving the systematics so high for the detector for the electron? Um, what electron will be? It's a little hard to answer, but um, yeah, I don't have a great answer to that. Um, I will say that for various reasons, the detector systematics are a little bit limited by the statistics we can generate in the simulation. So they tend to go up where the simulation statistics go down. Um, and that's probably also part of what's happening with those higher energies. But it's the best yeah. estimate we have, so it's what we use. Um, Kurt, why you list the one U1P and the one U1P together? You want you want to show they are similar or? Um. Well, so I'm gonna. It'll make more sense in a couple of slides. But oh. these uncertainties are correlated to each other across the two channels, and that's how we leveraging that information is how we do the constraints. So I think it is useful to see them side by side, although. The correlations are not obvious because we're just looking at basically the diagonals of the covariance matrix. Um, yeah. And the hadron is just basically what's called final state interaction? Um, is... No, final state interactions are in the cross section. The hadron reinteraction is basically after the hadron has left the nucleus, it can scatter off of a second argon nucleus. That's what that is. Okay. Um, for our signature, they're very, very small. So you combine what happens in the nucleus. 
Yeah, everything that happens in the initial nucleus as a one system logic? goes under cross-section, yeah. And it has to do with the software tools. So all the cross-section systematics, including the FSI, come from our neutrino event generator uh, called Genie, which doesn't really matter, but it is, that's what it's called. And then the Hadron Reinteraction is handled um, separately by JONT4. Um, so because they're coming from two different places, they get two separate lines on this plot. So I guess I'm gonna not able to disentangle what is the systematic, I mean, what is the biggest contribution for the cross-section systematics, whether it is the cross-section itself or the FSI model? Or do you have Correct. I, I mean, and nor can we tell in the detector, really, because we can only see what comes out of that nucleus after FSI anyway, if that makes sense. Yeah, but I mean, okay. I'm happy to talk more after. I like the way your question is going, um, but I have a few more slides. I will wait for my last for my comment on this until the end. <laughs> yeah, um, and I, maybe some of it is going to get a little bit addressed in the next few slides as well. Um, so uh, just in, in principle, thinking about how we're constraining our systematics, um, our new and our new mu events have certain stuff in common, and that's what allows us to use the measurement of the new mu to constrain the new e. So philosophically, um, this is happening kind of in two ways. One is on the flux side. Um, the neutrinos are coming from the same beam. They're coming from the decays of same or related particles. So when we measure the new mu, we learn about that parent population and we can propagate that forward into what's going on with the new mu. Um, on the cross-section side, in a sense, it's even simpler. As long as you believe in lepton universality, more or less, um, you know, we can measure what's going on with the muons, and we expect the same thing to happen for the electrons. It's a neutrino interacting via the weak interaction with an argon nucleus. Um, so, for example, the FSI systematics are super well constrained by this. Um, mathematically, it's just a little bit of linear algebra. Um, multivariate statistics, if you had a favorite multivariable statistics textbook, you could open it up, find a formula something like this that tells you how to condition a part of a multivariate Gaussian distribution based on the other part of that multivariate Gaussian distribution. Um, and that's basically what we're doing with our winning UNP and our winning UNP. Um, so the constrained winning UNP prediction at its base depends on that joint covariance matrix um, and how the one UNP compares to its one UNP or the one UNP prediction. So um, this is the one UNP we plot, plot again. I'm going to point out two things really quick. One is that we have a slight data excess, um, about 8%, and the other is that that data excess is concentrated mostly at the lower energies, up to about 600 MeV. Um, and so when we apply constraint to the one UNP, we expect to see it do a similar thing, go slightly up, especially at low energies. Um, and that's exactly <coughs> what we get. I have, a, um, I have a question there. Yeah, go ahead. Is it clear it would be Gaussian? No. Um, that's an assumption we make as part of the analysis technique. Um, so that's basically assuming that our systematics can be treated in a Gaussian way. We know that's not perfectly true, um, but we think it's a reasonable to conservative approximation, and that's the analysis framework that we live in. Um, I think future analyses are certainly exploring other ways to incorporate the systematics, including pull terms and things like that that would let you do it in a non-Gaussian way. Okay, um, great. So we apply the constraint. Um, we do get the slight increase, about 6%, in the expected number of uh, new events. Small compared to our statistical error, so kind of shrug, but it's there. Um, and then we do get a reduction in the systematic uncertainty. So um, this black line here is the unconstrained uncertainty that I showed a few slides ago, and this purple line shrinks it down. That's what we get after the constraint. Um, that said, the analysis is very systematic or statistics limited, so also kind of shrug, but it is what it is. Um, and this kind of thing will matter a little bit more in the next generation of analyses that will use double the data and will hopefully have greater efficiency as well due to reconstruction improvements. Um, so this will matter a bit more. Um, and this constrained prediction with its constrained uncertainties are the inputs to the statistical tests which I'm going to talk about um, in the next couple of slides. And um, yeah, OK, so we do a few statistical tests, um, starting with the goodness of fit. So basically, does our data 
look like our prediction? Question mark. Um, as you can see by eye, not really. Those black data points are scattered a bit about the um, about the prediction, and probably more than you would expect from uh, statistical fluctuations alone. Although those are significant. Um, so this table here is sort of summarizing our results, but. The H0 prediction is our prediction without any LEE, so again, magenta plus green. Um, that over the full energy range gives uh, a p-value 0.014, about 2.5 sigma tension. Um, and on the other hand, our uh, prediction with the LEE, which we call it H1, obviously we have not an excess at low energies, if anything, maybe a deficit, um, so that gives much greater tension. Um, and the other statistical test I'm going to talk about today is a simple hypothesis test. So we do this using a delta chi square. We basically um, take the difference between the goodness of bit chi squares that were used in the statistical test on the previous slide. Um, and let me explain this plot because it's kind of the most helpful thing. So um, for all of our statistical tests, actually, we do what we call frequentist studies. So we basically don't assume a true chi-square distribution because we live in a low statistics regime and we just don't trust it. Um, so what we do is we sample from the covariance matrix and then Poisson sample on top of that to generate an expected distribution of this delta chi-square test statistic under the no LEE hypothesis here in red and the LEE hypothesis here in blue. Um, and then we compare our data observation to those two sort of empirically generated distributions. Um, so when the data falls down here, you can see this is pretty low compared to both of the expected delta chi square distributions. Um, and the way we compute a p-value for this is we compute the probability that a delta chi square drawn from this distribution or this distribution comes out lower than the data. So for the no LED hypothesis for H0, that comes out to about a 2% probability. We call that 2.1 sigma tension. Um, and then for the LEE hypothesis in blue, it's obviously much smaller. That comes out to about 3.6 in potential. Um, okay, a little technical, but bear with me. Um, because our observation looks kind of funky compared to our supposedly null hypothesis, we apply something called the CLS method. Um, and basically what we do there is you take the ratio of those two p-values um, to get what's called the CLS value and convert that into a significance instead. So uh, with that, we could say we reject the LE hypothesis in favor of the null with a significance of 2.4 sigma, taking into account that the data also looks kind of weird relative to the null. Um, okay, so that was one of the analyses. I obviously do not have time to talk for the others in a similar amount of detail, um, but in one slide, this is what the other electron-like analyses see. Um, they see pretty similar stuff. You can see um, in the inclusive search and then in the 1ENP, again, relatively consistent with the um, intrinsic prediction. If anything, maybe a deficit um, and no evidence for an excess, um, except for maybe this bin, which will catch your eye, but I'll just point out that the new contribution in this plot is the green color. So this bin is background dominated anyway. Um, this is definitely something to be explored further, but not, not today. Um, okay, I'm going to blitz through the photon light search, and I apologize to uh, y'all for doing this a little quickly. But um, so, like I said, we tested this other hypothesis for this NC delta rad contribution, mustard yellow in the mini boom plot. That process looks like this. So the neutrino comes in, it excites a delta resonance. Um, in the argon nucleus, and that delta resonance radiatively decays to a nucleon plus a single photon. That nucleon can be either a proton or a neutron, and this analysis actually explored both channels, as I think I'll say on the next slide. Um, and then you see the single photon, which again travels some distance before it pair produces, so it's detached from the actual interaction vertex. Um, this process, this NC delta radiative process, has not been directly measured in a neutrino <coughs> scattering experiment. Um, and unlike the other photon-related backgrounds in the mini boon plot, this could not be directly constrained in mini boon. And um, if you do kind of ratio by eye, 
the shape of the mustard yellow matches the shape of the excess pretty well. It can actually be explained by just increasing that yellow contribution by about a factor of three, a little over three, um, which compared to the theoretical errors is not crazy, <laughs> let's put it that way. So this was a, a pretty compelling candidate for the mini boon excess, at least um, per some people in the community. So we went out and we tested it. Where did the theoretical errors come from? Like um, calculations theory? on the branching fraction of the delta, given that it's created and decaying in the nuclear environment. Obviously, the delta branching fraction has been measured in the real world, but you put it in a nucleus and things change. Um, so, um, this search looked at primarily two topologies, um, basically that decay process where there's either a proton or a neutron in the final state. We can't see the neutrons, so it either looks like a photon plus a proton trap or a photon plus nothing. Um, photon plus nothing, really hard to find. Um, so the 1 gamma 1 p channel ends up being the more sensitive of the two. Um, and in this case, the backgrounds and the systematic uncertainties on them we're also constrained using uh, a sideband selection. In this case, the main backgrounds are from um, neutral current events that produce a delta resonance that produces a pi zero. That pi zero decays to two photons, so you get these two gamma events. Um, if one of those gammas isn't reconstructed or gets eaten, they migrate into the one gamma one p or one gamma zero p channel. Um, but a sideband measurement of these guys was used to constrain the backgrounds. Um, actually similar to the analysis I think that anybody used. So one slide on the results of this analysis. Um, this is the one gamma one p on the left, one gamma zero p on the right. The, and then within each plot, it's the unconstrained on the left and the constrained result on the right. Um, I'll just come over here and talk about the one gamma one p because you can actually see the signal. So um, basically up to the solid black line on both plots is the expected backgrounds without the NC delta rad process at all. The shaded solid yellow is the standard model expectation or the expectation according to our event generator for this process. And then there's an extra two and a bit on top of that. Um, that's this dashed yellow line that is what would explain the mini moon excess by scaling up risk process. Um, so you can see the data hanging out in line with the baseline expectation um, with sort of the prediction, the baseline prediction for this process. Um, again, no evidence for the excess. So um, yeah, um, and this can be used to constrain that branching fraction that gives the, uh, that was used to determine the theoretical uncertainties as well. Um, and I'll just say that uh, Microgreen also ended up setting an upper bound, not quite directly measuring this process, um, but this bound is 50 times better than the previous limit, uh, which was set by the TDK experiment. So this is, while not a direct observation, still a huge step forward in the understanding of this particular process in neutrino scattering. Um, okay, so a couple plots that are a little busy, I'm not going to talk about them, but the bottom line here is that Microgreen has investigated this mini boon low energy excess anomaly in several final states, um, looking at both new E's and NC delta radiative decays. Uh, and it seems like neither of these is the primary driver of the mini boon excess, at least to our ability, best of our ability to tell so far. Um, so that leaves a really important question. There's this mini boon excess hanging out. It's almost five sigma significant. And we still don't know what it is. So, um, what? In short, what? Um, and so my next few slides are going to kind of try and answer that, um, or at least give you some food for thought. Um, so, mini moon itself has actually, in the last couple of years, um, put out results that are consistent with this in the sense that if you explore the mini moon data in 2D space and in spaces other than reconstructed energy, um, the results don't really look like this either. So um, I've just kind of cherry picked one plot, which is cosine theta of the uh, candidate electron shower, um, the angle relative to the beam. And you can see this uh, excess is really quite forward peaked in a way that um, the Nui backgrounds and the NC delta backgrounds are not. Um, so in response to this and other things, the community, um, our friends in theory have developed 
a number of theories. Um, I would say most of them involve some source, beyond standard model source, of photon-like events in mini moon, um, perhaps alongside any appearance from sterile neutrino oscillations, but not necessarily. Um, so this is an example of one model that has both new appearance from sterile oscillations and then also those sterile neutrinos doing other things that produce photon-like <coughs> events. Um, so the good news is that with a large APC in Microboon and with a full SVN program, we're really well set up to probe a number of these other possibilities. Um, this is a totally non-exhaustive list of theories that are on the market to explain the mini-boon excess that are not necessarily things that would be picked up by the current generation of microboon analyses. Um, but these are things we're planning to probe further in the future. So um, I'll make two notes. Um, one is that these models come with varying degrees of hadronic activity. That is something that miniboon could not see, and we can on a large APC. So um, this is something we're really looking forward to, looking at hadronic activity with showers and showers without hadronic activity um, to help us distinguish between some of these models. Um, another thing that's come up, actually become kind of more and more talked about and int interesting, is models that produce neither electrons nor photons, but rather produce E plus E minus pairs, um, usually from something that's decaying. Um, and those E plus E minus pairs can look <coughs> either exactly like a photon, if they're right on top of each other, it would look just like a photon that pair produces. Um, so that could be picked up by some of our current analyses. Or if the kinematics are different, if they have some opening angle, or if the energies are asymmet very asymmetric, um, this can look completely different. So this is a rich area that microboon really has not started to prove very much yet, although people are working on it now. Um, this is a similar thing. So uh, vertical axis is different models. Um, horizontal axis is different final states. So you can see we've started to probe a bunch of these, but not all of them. Um, and again, we've only used about half the data set, so there's a lot more to do, um, as well as reconstruction improvements and things like that that can be made. Sorry, some of these have check marks, but not references at the EV scale sterols? Um, yes, so the EV scale, EV scale sterols is like the long-standing explanation for NLC and the moon, and there's probably a good deal um, so oh, I think, sorry, these, the, the, num oh, the numbers are the model, the theory papers, or it's, it's yeah, I think studies. No, no, no. Okay. These numbers map on to these numbers. Oh, okay, no. Yeah. Um, we wish we had studied all yeah. of these and published all okay. of that. Talk to me about yours. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So with that, I'll wrap up and I can take extra questions. Um, yeah. My group put out its results last fall. These first results addressing the low energy excess. Um, we seem to disfavor both the low energy EV and NC delta rad as the primary source of the moon excess. Um, while that kind of remains open, we've learned a lot during this process. So microbeam has led really significant advances in several areas related to doing precision neutrino measurements in LRTPC, things like understanding and modeling our detector physics, calibrations, evaluating our detector uncertainties, um, understanding neutrino argon interactions with the GEV scale, um, and development of three very different, um, each interesting in their own way, reconstruction paradigms, including applications of advanced systems like deep learning. And uh, I hope this has been interesting, but please keep in mind that this is just the first phase of results from both Microboom and the full three detector SVN program that will test an array of BSM explanations for the mini moon anomaly. Um, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
Um, there's a fun table that I don't have in this talk that kind of lays all that out. But um, the other thing about argon that's really nice actually is that it liquefies um, just above the temperature of liquid nitrogen. So we can run all our cryogenics with liquid nitrogen, which is also a lot cheaper than, say, running colder cryogenics where you need like liquid heat or something. Okay, let's spend a little more about the mechanics when E and P channel. Why is that N P positive? So um, the multiple protons you need. Yeah. Yeah, that's mostly happening where you have um, either final state interactions where you knock out additional protons, uh, but it's still CCQ, or you have um, other types of interactions. So uh, the main ones that are important at microwave energies are what we call um, 2P2H. So the, neut the neutrino effectively scatters off a nucleon pair instead of a single nucleon, um, or resonance interactions where you have um, some resonance that's excited that produces multiple final state particles. Um, yeah, did that answer your question? E, like, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah? Um, so like when we, when we talked about the reconstruction stuff, um, yeah. so like, well, I guess we would feed the, the network some image um, does it like get out like energy and like position stuff like using like the brightness of it? Like is that how we get energy? Is that how we determine what the particle is? So the energy is actually um, in the re the deep learning based reconstruction. The energy is actually still coming from a conventional algorithm. Okay. So we uh, use the output of the sparse um, semantic segmentation network to help us identify the shower pixels, and then we have a separate algorithm, conventional algorithm that clusters those shower pixels together. And then we just do a conversion from the total integrated charge measured in those pixels to the energy. I um, actually have a whole paper on that. But um, yeah. Um, and then similarly for the tracks, the best way to actually reconstruct the energy of a track in large PCs so far is to find the length <coughs> of the track, identify the particle, and basically inverse the beta block equation um, to get from the length to the energy of that particle. Um, you can also add up all the energy along the track, but that turns out to be less precise with the current piece. So we do a range-based reconstruction for um, track lengths to energy. I have a related question. Yep. So what's the dynamic range you're getting from the uh, input for the neural networks? Let's say, what's the maximum value you can have for a pixel? Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, that I don't know the answer to off the top of my head, but we encode it in the networks using half precision floats, uh, if that helps. Um, so I think it's too. Yeah, a little bit easy. technical, but do, do you normalize these inputs for your network? Uh, define normalize. I don't think so. So you're putting the raw values written out from the detector. Okay, network. not quite raw. So the raw waveforms come out of the detector. They have a lot of stuff in them. They have noise. We do some noise removal at the waveform level. And then we do um, what we call deconvolution, which takes us from the raw waveforms to, um, to the best of our ability to tell the number of ionization electrons that arrive at the wire as a function of time. Um, and that process is actually quite important. I didn't talk about this, but on two of the three planes, the signals are actually bipolar. So you really need to remove that electronics response before you, that bipolar electronics response, before you go and look at the image and expect to get something useful out of it. But yeah, what, what we feed in other than that is exactly that number of electrons that arrive as a function of time, post deconvolution, raw waveform. Um, a little bit of light. We can press in the time dimension to get basically a square aspect ratio, but that's it. That's all the pre-processing we do. Can you go back to your uh, systematics well, uh, Yeah, the two side by side. Yeah, it's, it was a really nice talk. Thank you for having I mean, this. My only concern here is that uh, if, if you mentioned that you combine cross section FSIs, you want to know systematic, right? Combine. Well, I, they come combined, combined is... to us, but continue. Yeah, I want to hear what you, your concern. <laughs> so cross sections are given. Are measured by nucleon, right? So mini bone was carbon, TH. So we know the cross section from quartz elastic by yeah. nucleon. 
Yeah. In Argon per Nucleon, so it's hard to scale to the number of nucleons. The FSI is completely different because you have different nuclear environment. Yeah. So that's why I think if I want to play the game with Abicot, I will say that the only difference between this analysis and mini one is that FSIs are not really correct. Um, <clears throat> so... And then especially if you show me this plot, it's like, oh, can I disentangle what you... Because argon is very dense, right, compared to carbon. Uh, you expect that the FSIs play a big role than in carbon. And especially since micro one is CH, you have hydrogen and carbon, so hydrogen there's no FSIs. Yeah. Um, so I agree with you, <laughs> I think, kind of, mostly. But um, we actually have a much bigger problem than that, which is that mini boon and micro boon use completely different neutrino interaction generators with significantly different models in them anyway. So, uh, but we can run Gini with the minimum plots. In principle, yes, but then you need to feed it through the mini boon detector simulation and the mini boon reconstruction and get the mini boon efficiencies. And people have been talking about doing that for years, and it has not happened because it is hard. Um, also, the mini boot computers are like 30 years old and don't want to run any modern software. Um, so while that would be great, and I hope someday someone actually gets around to doing that analysis, um, that's sort of not technically feasible right now. Um, but I think the thing that I would say is that we basically, in, in pursuing this analysis strategy, we did our best to let mini boon decide what was self-consistent for them, and then we tried to do something self-consistent for microboon using the models that we have now. Um, so it's not ideal, but uh, it is what it is. The other thing I will say is that because miniboon really can't see very much on the hadronic side of things, they can see charged primes, but can't see protons or neutrons at all, really. Um, they're not super sensitive to that. So that's why I think it's very important for you guys to break this down into a cross section and FSI, because then just, you can see that we have an FSI on such an thing of uh, X, Y versus the minimum that cannot see any protons or something like that. Right. The press, so yeah. that is certainly part of the micro like cross section physics program, understanding those kinds of effects. It's pretty and testing it's probably, uh, probably just chat after and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? I know we're over time. Yes. Yeah. Just like quick generic thing. Um, so how, like, what's the quick terminology thing? Like, yeah. What is the difference between baseline and L over E? L is like the length of. Yeah. So L L is the baseline. L and baseline are synonymous. L over E is the baseline divided by the energy, which is what the oscillations are as a function of. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, that wasn't clear earlier. I probably should have defined baseline a little more carefully. All right. In the absence of additional questions. Thanks, Lauren. Oh, yeah, sorry. Did Zoom people have questions? <laughs> All right, please bring it on. What can I tell you? Okay. You want to know more about this person before? Why don't I send you that paper? I think I read it on the paper. You probably did. Yeah, I um, Yeah, so the way that network is made, um, there were a few tricks to it. Um, but basically, we simulated events, particle gun style, so not including any you know, interaction schematics. Um, sorry. Sorry. And. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, 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 so,